They called him Flo. And then there were those who called him Ziggy. But to those who knew him only from Two on the Isle, Row E, he was Florenz Ziegfeld, the greatest showman of the century. the Magnificent, or a witch doctor presiding over tribal dances, Ziegfeld has been compared to both. Certainly the period in which he lived, a world of bizarre yet naive impulses and precarious wealth, is vividly mirrored in the extravagances of his life. A secret of Ziegfeld's success was his strong sense of the outrageous and the way he exploited it. He was the greatest showman of the century, and his enthusiasm and lack of inhibition confounded alike his wives, friends and enemies. Yet he was also the stimulator and exploiter of genius in others, designers, scriptwriters, dancers, musicians, singers and comics. Ziegfeld brought the first edition of his Many Follies to New York in 1907, with Anna Held, the renowned French starlet and Ziegfeld's first wife, starring. The title was her suggestion. This novel musical review caught the mood of the times and revolutionized show business. The Follies became an annual production on Broadway, and through the years, the chorus lines featured some of the most beautiful women ever to walk across a stage, all personally selected by Ziegfeld, whose avowed aim was to glorify the American girl. He succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. Anna Held, Billy Burke, Ina Clare, Mae Murray, Marilyn Miller, Billy Dove, Lillian Lorraine, Olive Thomas, up to some 3,000 of them over the years, in the follies and out. To be a Ziegfeld girl was to be the utmost in sophistication, the most desired of all the desired, and the master showman spinning wondrous webs of fashion and fancy was Ziegfeld. Broadway. Ah, Broadway, I can see it again. The Broadway of 1907. The Broadway that was waiting for me. An innocent world believing in a golden future, full of peace and laughter and beautiful girls. And here's the theatre where my first folly is opened. As I look at that theatre now, it's all mine forever. No taxes, no bills, and no competitors. There they are, my first public. The high and mighty, and the hoi polloi. And here they're all mine. Eternal toys that never grow old. Look at Mrs. Astor in her beautiful carriage. With her famous horse. Much more famous that night than Siegfeld. And didn't the horse know it? And Diamond Jim Brady, with no horse, but what a filly inside the car. There they are, an old New York first night audience, the judge and the jury. What have you got, Mr. Ziegfeld? Show us your magic if you dare. Make us dream if you can. What have you got, Mr. Ziegfeld? Mrs. Astor. I can pretend all my great stars never grew older, are still dancing and singing as they did years ago. Marilyn Miller.
Bonnie Bryce. Look at me, oh, look at me. Oh, I'm an Indian. Uh-huh. I'm an Indian. Will Rogers. Well, uh, what'll I talk about? I ain't got anything to say. It's funny. All I know is what I read in the paper. I can hear the applause. As if it hadn't disappeared into the past. The New York night still burns for me with the names I've branded into the sky. Great shows that were part of the dreams of America. How many millions of people today remember their courtships, their honeymoons, their anniversaries, their happiest moments in terms of a Ziegfeld show? The world will never forget the Ziegfeld Follies. The Ziegfeld Follies were an institution and their creator was unique. Nothing in the American theater has ever been quite like them. Nobody's ever been able to imitate them successfully, although George White tried with his scandals and Earl Carroll with his vanities. No, the Follies were unique, and so was their creator. Here's Fred Astaire. What can I say about Ziegfeld? Well, I can only tell you that as long as there's a dance, a song, a musical show, and it's good, Somewhere around or in it is Ziegfeld. He never cared so much about villains, plots, stories. The Follies never had a story. The Ziegfeld Follies was itself a story of an era. It was gay, bright, beautiful. That's how Ziggy wanted it. And oh, I almost forgot. The girls. Ziggy was a specialist at glorifying girls. That's one of the most important things about the Follies, you know. So, here's to the beautiful ladies, here's to those wonderful girls, Adele's and Molly's, Lucille's and Polly's, you find them all in the Ziegfeld Follies. Here's to the silks and the satin, here's to the diamonds and pearls. This is the mixture to start the picture, so bring on the beautiful girl. Here's to the silks and the satin. Here's to the diamonds and pearls, a sweet endeavor, a joy forever, so bring on the beautiful girl. The Ziegfeld girls, Lillian Lorraine, whose rare beauty was endlessly extolled in the press, who had a compulsion for speed and wild parties, and who ended her days dependent on charity. Dolores of the proud patrician posture and silky blonde hair who began modeling and quit the follies to make her marriage to a millionaire as successful as her stage career. Olive Thomas, considered by many the most beautiful of all Ziegfeld girls, whose unhappy marriage to Jack Pickford ended in sudden death in Montmartre, and many, many more. But the follies is much more than the story of the Ziegfeld girls. There's the story of Ziegfeld himself, a man with a genius for publicity and a rare taste for feminine beauty, never more perfectly expressed than in his two wives, Anna Held and Billy Burke. His first follies cost him $13,000 to put on. 20 years later, it cost him $300,000, and the customers were paying $200 a seat for the opening night. The follies is also the story of other men. The great comedians, the songwriters, whose songs written for the Follies of long ago are still being played today. The great designers, whose scenery and costumes made each edition of the Follies a breathtaking spectacle.
The Ziegfeld Follies. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the Depression. There was nothing to remind us, wrote Billy Burke, that in China, millions were struggling for a handful of rice. Everyone had fistfuls of money to spend. The world was a place created just for fun. And Flo, of all people, was the man best equipped for having that fun. The Ziegfeld touch was enough to bring millionaires to the Follies night after night after night, seeing the same show over and over and over again. Diamond Jim Brady, flaunting his cartwheel diamonds in his vest and at his cuffs, was happy to pay $750 for 10 opening night seats. And dozens of baskets of long-stemmed roses would arrive backstage for the Ziegfeld girls. Style was as important to the Diamond Jim Brady's of Wall Street as it was to the Ziegfeld girls and Ziegfeld himself. And tucked deep down in the blossoms were diamonds, bracelets, ropes of pearls, all the treasures of the earth that were beauty beyond treasure. And it was Ziegfeld who created it. Generations have grown up since the last Ziegfeld girl preened her feathers and strutted her stuff in the pink and gold spotlights. But to have been a Ziegfeld girl was to have been someone special. The most alluring, the most enchanting, the most fascinating, the most exciting, and above all, the most beautiful. Ziegfeld was born on March the 21st, 1868, into a comfortable middle-class home of German descent. His father, Dr. Florenz Ziegfeld, was a musical impresario and entrepreneur who brought Johann Strauss to America in 1872 and became his manager, and later assisted in organizing the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, now one of the finest orchestras in the world. The young Ziegfeld was anemic and frail, often ill, with little interest in anything. At 17, his parents, in a last-ditch, desperate move, sent him to a Wyoming cattle ranch. And after six months there, in a world of fresh air, hard work, cowboys, horses and six shooters, the young Ziegfeld returned to his home, transformed into an energetic, cheerful, vital young man. He'd also developed a will of iron, which his father, to his chagrin, could not bend. The young Ziegfeld had developed a taste for show business, and it seemed to him that with his father's official assignment as organizer of the musical entertainment for the Chicago World's Fair, this was an opportunity not to be missed. So he went to Europe, bringing back seven military bands and an awesome collection of French and Russian performers. And they flopped. They didn't like Chicago, and certainly Chicago had absolutely no taste for them. But the great Sandow, that was something else. Eugene Sandow was a strong man with devilish good looks and a physique that made Adonis pallid by comparison. He'd stripped down to a strategically placed fig leaf and begin flexing his muscles with such superb control as to cause matronly bosoms to heave, well-bred ladies to faint, and occasion young men to go running for the burnt feathers and spirits of camphor. He was a sensation. He was getting $3,000 per week. Ziegfeld, ten times that, and he was worth it. Because somehow, by some incredible feat of persuasion, Ziegfeld had induced some of the great respected dowagers of their time, like Mrs. Potter Palmer, irreproachably entrenched within the battlements of social splendor and wealth, to journey backstage to feel Sandow's mountainous muscles. Just how Ziegfeld did it remains a mystery. It certainly was showmanship, and Ziegfeld was on his... July the 8th, 1907, brought in the first of the Ziegfeld Follies, the Follies of 1907. The Follies would soon include the name of their creator in the title, and for a quarter of a century be a resplendent jewel of the musical theatre. Budgeted at $13,000, an unexceptional figure for the day, the Follies professed to be continental in its tone and style. 
Its very title called to mind the Parisian Follies Bergère. And for theatre-goers who failed to make the connection, the New York theatre roof was rechristened Jardin de Paris. Ziegfeld's wife, for Anna Hild had become that, originally convinced him that something like the voguish Parisian Review might appeal to New Yorkers, although the title might not have been derived from the French Follies, but from a column written by the show's first librettist, Harry B. Smith, whose column had been called Follies of the Day. Fifty lovely Corines, the first in a long parade of breathtaking beauties, made even more dazzling by their association with Ziegfeld, were billed as the Anna Held Girls in an effort to convey to them some of the exotic, mischievous glamour of Ziegfeld's wife. The most famous name in the cast was Nora Bays. Nothing of any lasting value emerged from the evening, although Anna Held and her girls performed once again the song that had long been a... Ziegfeld's taste, imagination, lavish hand and persistence would eventually turn the Follies into a legend. His first edition was such a success with profits so large that Ziegfeld determined to offer an even better edition next year, and he did. The Follies of 1908 again starred Nora Bays, and in it, she sang a song she had written with her husband Jack Norworth. It was to become the first of the Ziegfeld hit songs, and one which he featured in many editions of the Follies, right through to the very last in 1931, in which it was sung by Ruth Etting. The night was mighty dark, so you could hardly see. For the moon refused to shine. Couple sitting underneath a willow tree. For love, they hate pine. Little maid was kind of afraid of darkness. So she said, I guess I'll go. Boy began to cry, looked up at the sky, told a little tale of woe. Oh, shine on, shine on, harvest moon, up in the sky. I ain't had no love since April, January, June, or July. Setting singing Shine On Harvest Moon. By 1910, the Follies were easing into a definite pattern. They were also improving with each edition. Two newcomers were the major improvement in that year. Fanny Bryce and Bert Williams the Comic were probably two of the finest performers Ziegfeld ever presented. Fanny Bryce was born in the great melting pot of New York's Lower East Side, and her first performances were warbling in her parents' saloon. At 13, she won an amateur night contest, and three years later, was hired for a New York show, but was fired by the producer, George M. Cohan, probably because of her clownish antics as much as the fact that she couldn't dance. For a while, she worked the burlesque circuit, and it was there that Ziegfeld saw her. Reportedly, this is how it happened. Fanny Bryce and her discovery by Ziegfeld. For the next seven years, the Follies grew in production splendor, the beauty of the Ziegfeld girls, and the quality of his stars. Eddie Cantor first appeared for Ziegfeld in the 1917 edition, and the beautiful Dolores made her first splendid appearance. In 1918, Marilyn Miller appeared. So too did Will Rogers, Anne Pennington of the Dimpled Knees, and W.C. Fields. Then came the legendary 1919 edition, with his greatest collection of stars, Bert Williams, Van and Schenk, Eddie Cantor and John Steele, who was to introduce the Follies theme song, one of Irving Berlin's greatest achievements, and the song that was destined to become a part of the Follies from then on. I have an ear for music, and I have an eye for a maid. I link a pretty girly with each pretty tune and played. They go together like sunny weather, goes with a man of a day. I've studied girls and music, so I'm qualified to say a pretty girl is like a melody. That on you night 
upon a day, just like the train of a haunting refrain, she'll start upon a marathon and run around your brain. You can't escape. She's in your memory, my morning, night, and noon. A pretty girl is just like a pretty tune. A pretty girl is like a melody that haunts you night and day. Just like the strain of a haunting refrain, she'll start upon and run around your brain, you can't escape. She's in your memory, my morning, night, and noon. She will leave you, and then come back again. A pretty girl is just like a pretty John Steele introducing Irving Berlin's A Pretty Girl Is Like a Melody for the first time in the Ziegfeld Follies of 1919. The following year came what many regarded as the best of them all. Most critics, insisting that the Follies were improving every year, thought so anyway. It was an expensive production, the first to cost Ziegfeld over a quarter of a million dollars. By the standards of the day, when an ordinary musical could still be sumptuously mounted for $50,000, it was a mammoth sum. As always, the parade of beautiful girls was enthralling, and the comics, in this edition, Raymond Hitchcock, W.C. Fields, Ray Dooley and Fanny Bryce, as funny as ever. The score was unmemorable, but two subsequent interpolations proved to be enduring. Both were sung by Fanny Bryce. Fanny's I'm an Indian too is still sung in Yiddish dialect to audience acclaim. Barbara Streisand does it, for example. And then there was the great French import, Mon Homme, by Maurice Yvain. Here's how Hollywood likes to think its presentation in the Follies came about. He isn't true. He thinks me too. What can I do? Oh, my man. Bryce with My Man. The 22nd edition of The Follies opened a month earlier than usual. The theatre season usually started in June. So Broadway had the unusual appearance of two editions running simultaneously. The 1922 production is generally looked upon as the last great edition, although most of the big names had left. Only Will Rogers remained, with Gilda Gray and Mary Eaton contributing their glamour. Only one novelty song endures from a lacklustre score. But what a one that is. Yeah. 
It's Mr. Gallagher. It's Mr. Gallagher. As I live, why, it's my old pal, Mr. Sheen. <laughs> How long have you been here? I've been over here a year. It's the strangest country that I've ever seen. Oh, Mr. Sheen. Oh, Mr. Sheen. Over here, why, we can both live European. Yes? Yeah? Ride around on camel's backs and we'll pay no income tax. Positively, Mr. Gallagher. Absolutely, Mr. Sheen. <laughs> Mr. Gallagher, mm -hmm. Mr. Gallagher, I understand one day you saved a lady's life. In a rowboat out at sea, you were a hero done to me. Someone said that you had made this girl your wife. Oh, Mr. Sheer, oh, Mr. Sheer, when she sank, I dove down like a submarine. Dragged her out upon the shore, now she's mine forevermore. Who? The lady, Mr. Gallagher. No, the rowboat, Mr. Sheer. <laughs> At the palace you will see some wonderful sight. Are you the redhead on the end? I'd like to be your friend. How about the little date with me tonight? Oh, Mr. Sheen. Oh, Mr. Sheen. Why you haven't got a look in with that queen? Why not? She has millionaires untold who have lavished her with gold. To keep her friendship, Mr. Gallagher. To keep her mouth shut, Mr. Sheen. <laughs> Mr. Gallagher, today I paid a visit to a gallery. Of all the statues that they show, I think Venus de Milo is the greatest in all Greek mythology. Oh, Mr. Sheen. Oh, Mr. Sheen. Well, for de Milo's Venus, I'm not very keen. Why not? For the thing that spoils a charm of the pair of broken arms. I didn't see them, Mr. Gallagher. Where were you looking, Mr. Sheen? Charlie Winnegar with the original Mr. Sheen of the song, Al Sheen. Only five more editions of the Follies were to come. By 1931, times were dismal. It was the nadir of the Depression. Many of the best Broadway talents were leaving for Hollywood if they were not already there. For those who remained, especially the great old line producers, enforced idleness and bankruptcy loomed. Producers who'd lived from production to production, men like Ziegfeld, were the hardest hit. And with the 31 edition, the follies ended. But a new medium was holding Depression America enthralled. Radio. And so, Ziegfeld brought the Ziegfeld touch to the airwaves. March the 14th, 1932, and Eddie Darling introduces the second of the Ziegfeld Chrysler radio shows. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you the young man who produced that great show 25 years ago and who has since become a greater name than any of his dozens of shows, Mr. Florence Bigfell. I'll never forget that night, Eddie, but there are a couple of things you haven't told. On the sidewalk in front of the theater, a young fellow was selling tickets. Later, he became our greatest producer of dramatic extravaganzas, Morris Guest. And across the street at Hammerstein's Victoria Theater, a boy was playing in a vaudeville act called A Night in an English Music Hall. Now he is the most popular comedian the world has ever known, Charlie Chaplin. That's right, Flo. You never know what great talent will turn up. You never know. For example, where did you find Kate Smith? Oh, that's funny. At a benefit performance in Washington, just as the moon came over the mountain. <laughs> Remember the night, Addie, I dragged you through the rain up to a smoky little cafe in the 50s to listen to a girl sing? Remember it, I'll never forget it. You recall, Flo, when we stepped in the door, there was a great male quartet singing. I know that you know that I'll go Where you go, I choose you, won't lose you I wish you knew how much I long to hold you in my arms This time is my time, will soon be Goodbye time, and in the starlight Hold me tight, with one more little kiss, say nighty-night Oh, you bring me up here in the rain to listen to four men. 
No, I brought you up here to hear a girl. And there she is. Well, she's sitting on the piano. Say, that's a cute idea. And oh, isn't she beautiful. What's her name, Flo? Her name is Helen Morgan. Listen to her. Life was never so blue till I saw love passing on. And now everything's beautiful. You came with love and you're gone. Winter skies are more cold now. And I'm part of their grave. Get her ready, but don't tell her it's Ziegfeld, or she'll want a lot of money. All oh, right, boss. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. Excuse me, Miss Morgan. My name is Eddie Dowling. Well, how do you do, Mr. Dowling? There's a gentleman sitting at the table with me who'd like to talk to you about going into a new show. Oh, what's his name? Oh, that doesn't matter so much. You wouldn't know him. All right. I'd be glad to talk to him. We're sitting right over here across. I loved your voice. Well, boss, here's Miss Morgan. I told her you wanted her for a show. Good evening, Mr. Ziegfeld. How'd you know who I was? Why, I, I worked for you a long time ago in the chorus of Sally. Why didn't you sing for me then? Oh, Mr. Ziegfeld, I was too afraid. Well, anyhow, I want you for my new show, Showboat. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ziegfeld. That will be a great honor. Showboat, the legendary Ziegfeld book musical. Oh, yes, Ziegfeld's name was synonymous with the Follies, of course, but he also produced Sally, Kid Boots, Whoopi, Rosalie, The Three Musketeers, Rio Rita, and the Kern Ferber Hammerstein masterpiece that contains just about the best score ever written for a musical. And here's a charming story about the creation of the show, told by Oscar Hammerstein in conversation with Arnold Michaelis. 
Well, speaking of showboats, Oscar, I'm interested in the relationship that you had with Flo Ziegfeld. Well, that's the only play I ever did with Ziegfeld. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because I found that Ziegfeld was a man who had no equal when it came to taste in the theater for visual effects, for the beauty of girls, for the beauty of scenery and costumes, and for what the audience saw. He was strangely uninterested in what they heard and didn't know much about it. I don't think he knew much about jokes. When he put on the follies, he hired good comedians. He had never done a play with a story before, and I think that before we opened, he expected Showboat to be a pretty big bore, and he thought all that story stuff would be cut out, <laughs> and uh, what would remain would be the pretty costumes and scenery and the tunes and the girls and the comedian. Ziegfeld had asked Jerry and me to hurry it up because he wanted to open the Ziegfeld Theater with it. We didn't know that he, at the same time, had told another set of authors and composers to hurry up with their play, Rio Rita, so that he could open up the theater with it. Well, they beat us. They finished first, and Rio Rita went into rehearsal, went up to Boston, and he decided to open his theater with Rio Rita. And he was going to put our play in another theater. So I was up at Jerry's house in Bronxville one day, and I said, nothing's happening. We don't hear from Ziegfeld, although we'd finished our manuscript by then. And I said, what do you think? What's the delay? And Jerry said, I don't think he's got enough money to put our show on. <laughs> I said, well, how do we find that out? Jerry said, we ask him. So a few minutes later, Jerry being a man of action and a very spunky sort of a fellow, we were in a car bound for Hastings on the Hudson where we would go right into Ziegfeld and say, have you got the money to put on a showboat? Tell us yes or no. This was what we were going to do. This was a Sunday. We arrived at this very sumptuous looking French chateau type of mansion and a butler opened the door and he was the most imposing butler. I ever. He looked more like a bank president than a butler. <laughs> and he asked us to go into the drawing room and wait. We went into a beautiful room, Aubusson rugs, priceless objet d'art all over the room. And a very Ziegfeldian maid came in, in a black dress with white lace and apron and cap, <laughs> and asked us to wait a little longer. And then the bank president's son came down, assistant butler, and ushered us upstairs. They asked us to follow him to the west wing where Mr. Ziegfeld would meet us. So we went into the suite of this pauper who couldn't put on our show, <laughs> into his bedroom with a priceless four-poster bed and beautiful furnishings. And through the door, we could see his bathroom, which was as big as most drawing rooms. And Ziegfeld was being shaved by a man with a long white beard who looked like King Leopold of Belgium. <laughs> it was the most impressive production I'd ever seen on or off the stage. Then Ziegfeld said, wait a minute, boys. And then he came in, all shaven, in a beautiful brocaded dressing gown, and started to tell us about the wonderful business that Rio Rita was doing up in Boston. Everything exuded wealth. He asked us to stay for lunch. It was only potluck, because they hadn't expected us. But it consisted of cocktails, of course, and wonderful roast beef, and there were footmen standing behind every chair, and we had champagne, and the talk was very pleasant. And about 3.30 or 4, Jerry and I, in a kind of a misty contentment, waddled out of the house, never having dared to ask if we had enough money to put on showboat. We had had turtles imported up from Florida. We had all the delicacies in the world. How could you ask a man like that if he had money enough to put on a show? <laughs> That's wonderful.
October the 29th, 1929, the stock market crashed. Flo's losses totaled over a million, and with it, the world of Flo Ziegfeld. The final follies was a failure, as were Smiles and Hotchar. In these desperate efforts to retrieve his fortunes, Ziegfeld drove himself to the brink of madness. Like an exploding star, he literally burned himself out, his disaster no less dynamic than his triumphs. His wife, Billy Burke, was working in Hollywood when she heard his radio broadcasts. One night she heard his voice falter and subsequently said, it was only a little break, unnoticed by anyone else, but over 3,000 miles I caught the weariness and sickness of it. Arriving in New York, Billy found him a shadow of his former self. In her bungalow at Santa Monica, he rallied briefly, but extravagant to the last, he dispatched $6,000 in telegrams and thousands more in telephone calls. I know it's expensive, baby, he remarked, but you know I love the telephone. Pleurisy suddenly flared, and Flo died in the cedars of Lebanon Hospital on the afternoon of July the 22nd, 1932. He was 64. In Epitaph, Billy Burke selected a quatrain from Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. It reads, For him being dead, with him is beauty slain, and beauty dead, black chaos comes again. It'd be hard to say whether Ziegfeld's alchemy was achieved at greater cost to himself when producing a show, Ziegfeld worked furiously in 18-hour shifts to his associates or his backers. His writers and his designers were harried to madness and composers, among them Romberg, Kern, Fremmel, Gershwin and Berlin, fared no better. Ziegfeld was obviously endowed with initiative and daring, daring bordering on the reckless, imagination, charm and an ability to head straight for a given goal even by uncharted paths. And that is the stuff which theatrical dreams and greatness are made of. <laughs>